Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is David Sienbeck. I'm Lead uh, Industry and Service Officer from the APO. Thank you for joining our interview today with uh, Irene Umar, the Managing Director of the DNC in Indonesia. She has been working as a VC for some time, and also she has been investing in many good startup companies mm -hmm. in Indonesia as well as abroad. And so today, I'm so pleased to introduce her to you, Fierce. And let's listen to her insight on how to develop or nurture the ecosystem for productive entrepreneurship. Hello, Irene. How are you? Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for joining our interview today. Thank you for inviting me to the platform. Really appreciate it. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. And today I'm here to share about the ecosystem for productive entrepreneurship. I guess a little bit more about me is Maybe the reason why David invited me was because we met in the circumstances when I was developing or putting together an ecosystem for the gaming industry five years ago before gaming industry was even heard of or was very popular in Indonesia. In fact, one of my mentors had to pull my ear because I was involved in the gaming industry. They think that it's an industry that's going to ruin the future generations, but it's not as we can see today. And today I'm here to share about that. I'd like to start off with this quote, is that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. So when David asked me to talk about productive ecosystem and about entrepreneurship, I need to go back to the origin, to the beginning of the words itself. So please bear with me for a while while I walk through that and share where my insights come from while I build those ecosystems that I have in the gaming sector especially. The ecosystem for productive entrepreneurship, the word that I would like to highlight here is entrepreneurship. When we look into the ecosystem for productive entrepreneurship, over here, I'd like to begin by highlighting the word entrepreneurship. Because if we ask anyone across age, be it the older generations or the younger generations, a lot of us would like to be entrepreneurs. A lot of us would like to be business people. However, when we ask, why don't you start? There are a lot of reasons. And the common reasons is I don't have enough capital. I don't have enough experiences and I don't have enough network to start. But, but, but by the time they accumulate all the wealth, all the experiences and all the network, they felt that they are too old to start. So that's why I would like to get back to what is actually entrepreneurship at the very root for me. Since I'm a Chinese and I'm educated in my home as a Chinese family, entrepreneurship in my family it means Sun Yi. And if I'm to break down these two words, Sen in itself, literally translated, means life. E means meaning. So if you combine these words together, it's actually meaning of life. And that is why there's so many books out there that ask us, when you want to start something, start with why. I didn't understand why, that I have to start with why or what my why is until I look into these words and my dad sat me down and said, Irene, you know why we like to do business? It's because business is actually a meaning of life. However, there are so many people that are not happy, not happy meaning not productive, because the reason to do the business does not represent who they are. And that's why it's very important for me to start with the concept of entrepreneurship, because if we do not understand that, then it's almost impossible to do something productive. It's as if we go into a maze without a map and without the rules of the games, so without knowing how we can even end the game as a winner. It, we will not be triumphant on that. And that's why, please allow me to spend some time on this. Sun E, business, entrepreneurship, it's all about knowing your why. And when you know your why, you are 99% there. This is the power of intention. And the moment you know this, the rest is just mechanism. And in this world, and we as humans, we are blessed with such an amazing mind. Once we know the intention, the mechanism will be easy and the universe will usually show the way. The second part of this is the ecosystem. Ecosystem is not a new word. It has started since 1935. It's coined by a biologist, A.G. Tanksley. Before the start of startup world, we seldom hear about the word ecosystem other than in our biology books. Before the start of the startup world, 
We seldom heard the word ecosystem unless in our biology books. The reason is simple, but there's a parallelism for that. It started off from the very beginning, which in this case is 1935. If we look at the ecosystem on the left, you could see the ecosystem involves everything, be it a living or non-living factors in the environment. That is what ecosystem is. Ecosystem is everything that's within a space of time and era and space, really. That is what ecosystem is all about. I even bring this up from a very basic schooling systems, right? Where ecosystem info infographics, it starts by who is the producer. The main producer in this case is the tree. And then you have the primary consumers, which is like myself, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat meat. So I'm a primary consumer. I eat all those veggies, right? And also there are a lot of animals that also eat a lot of veggies. And then you have the secondary customers. And then you've got the play of the rain. You've got the play of the water. A lot of this thing, we've learned it from the past. However, we do not really always implement it in our life. But ecosystem itself is, again, not something new. It's not a new concept at all. It is based on nature. And when we understand nature, when we understand the way ecosystem works, then we can start talking about business. I'll start with Airbnb because I believe that in the whole world, everybody knows Airbnb. And then I'll transition to what I do in the gaming ecosystem. When we talk about Airbnb, this logo, the first thing that came to our mind is it involves a house. It involves a homeowner and it involves vacationers who like to do vacations. Let me ask you this. Is it really that simple? These are the stakeholders, all the people, the living and non-living creatures in the ecosystem of Airbnb. But behind the Airbnbs, behind the owners of these houses, there are a lot of things involved. You've got the house cleaners, you've got the cameramen to take pictures, you've got interior designers, you've got all these people that are involved in it. And they are non-living things. You've got multiple currencies, you've got rental management systems. This is a part of the ecosystem. And on the other side, you've got all this cooking school, yoga teacher, tracking. These are what we call as the experiences in the Airbnb sector. And then you've also got government. Now, all of these are the living and non-living creatures in an ecosystem that we all learn in the biology school. The difference is when we were doing biology, we were shown how those Ecosystem, how those living creatures and non-living creatures interact with each other. When the water evaporates to the sky, it becomes rains. But in this case, when it comes to business, it's all about innovations. It's all about thinking of how things work and how things are intertwined. So when Airbnb came to the picture, they started off with a very simple idea. People have a house. The house might be empty. Then there will be someone who wants to rent and someone who would like to rent it out for an income. However, as they grow obsessive about it, you can go fanatical about it, want to make it out of a business, you start to go behind the screen. What else is needed to make this work? What else is needed to make this efficient, which is the key to today's presentation, productivity. And that is why you would see these this people on the left is the key. People on the right is also the key. All of those are experiences. And the government is also a key sector there because remember, the government have to protect tourism, have to protect hotels and all of those. It's like in the beginning of Uber and Grab. And that's when the exciting parts come in. So the moment you map all of this out, then you can start to draw the lines on who does what. And what's very interesting in a business is that whenever it involves human, the person who rent out the house, he or, he or she also does go vacationing, right? So if he's so familiar and he benefits so much from the Airbnb ecosystem, do you think that when he goes for vacation, he'll use Airbnb? If he has such a great experience, of course he would. And that's when we come into the concept of circular economy. The users who benefit from it, who earn from it, will come back and use the same ecosystem. Same thing with the cleaners, same thing with the photographers. If the cleaner says that, oh, there's a standard that Airbnb imposed, I clean the house and I need to follow all these checklists. So if I go on vacation, I will definitely book Airbnb because I know the quality is proper. That's an example of how the ecosystem works. So for a productive ecosystem to work, we have 
to first identify who are in the ecosystem, and then we can draw the lines. Very similar to productive financing. In the case of Airbnb, it's all about getting the five-star ratings. All of us would like the five-star five ratings. In fact, our host, after we left the house, will be asking us, can you leave me a five-star ratings? It's all for productivity. It's all for that productive ecosystem. It's for all for efficiency and effectiveness. That's all we strive for in life in the same manner as how the nature works. The nature in itself, it works perfectly. And to know the ecosystem, you need to go deep. And for you to go deep, you need to be obsessive about it. Because a lot of people will think about this idea. I kid you not, my dad told me this. Irene, the moment you think of an idea that's brilliant, there's one million other people that think about it. And the next sentence would be, the key is execution. But before execution, it's actually to grow obsessive about it, to dig as deep as you can. If you do not understand it, it's okay. But the moment you put down all the pieces together, even the missing puzzles will suddenly appear. It's just like how, how it is when you assemble the puzzles. Examples of my experiences in the game industry that was this. I started off by, this is a very simple thing. I just started off by Googling it. When I first came into the gaming industry, I'm from a corporate finance background. I play games, as a lot of you does, but I do not understand the gaming industry until I found this mapping. So, and I started off in Indonesia, where gaming is something that is judged upon, and gaming is also something that people won't think that Indonesia have a million dollar um, games. People will not think that Indonesia have an award-winning games, but we do. So the key is to start with this. So when I map up the gaming ecosystem, we can see here what is needed. I started off with the game developers because they are the ones who develop games. Those are the studios, be it AAA, be it not AAA. Some of you would know these names, Blizzard, Respawn, and Valve, right? But I will go back one step. What do these people need in order to develop the games that they do. They need a software developers. But does it mean that they need to outsource this? Upon digging deeper, deeper, upon digging deeper and speaking to more game developers, I understand that they actually just need a software. At that time, the software is called as Unity. Using Unity, they can develop the games that they want. However, some of them, they also need hardware. I have an interesting story that I will share later on about hardware. Hardware developers in today's age of VR is like the VR headset. But if we go back a bit further down the line, Mario Bros, for example, if you do not have a Sega console, you'll not be able to play. Those are hardware. So we don't have to overcomplicate things, right? And the next part is the game publisher. After the game is done, who's going to go and publish them? Who's going to go there and market them? distribute them. Those are the game publishers' job. And the next step is the distributors or the retailers, right? It's like Google Play, Apple's, Apple Store, Steam if you play com computer games, distributor retailers. And then you go to the left side that involves esports, streaming services, gaming arenas. At this stage, I might have lost all of you because we're talking about gaming. But if you look at all of this and the the if you look at all of this and the logic behind it, all the industries revolve around the same thing. You have to start looking into the raw materials that is needed to produce something. This is the product. Very much like Airbnb, the products are house rentals and experience. House rentals and experience selling. It's all encircled around traveling. In the game developers, the product is the game itself. That's why it's called game industry, right? So when we know who the developers are, we need to know who's going to sell it because if things don't sell, then it's never going to get to the customer's hands. It's the same as the restaurant industry. It's the same thing. You need a location to sell it, supermarket or wherever it is. These are your media companies. Esports are the team. Imagine you're watching footballs. Streaming services are like your TV, your satellite TV. Gaming arenas are like when you watch concert. A lot of the things in any industry, it all revolves around the same thing. Hence, the key is just to identify them. 
Because the moment you identify them, I start to put this together into a map and you'll see a lot of empty spaces. So uh, like David said, I'm, I'm a venture capitalist, so I invest in startups, but I do not invest in startups simply because it's a hype. I like to collect startups to fulfill the entire ecosystem chain because I believe that if I have the entire ecosystem, I will be able to get all these companies to work together as brothers and sisters under DNC's flagship. I call them the DNC family so that they can grow together. They will be able to help each other. There will be no competition. They will feel that we are in this industry together and we shall grow. And if those companies are too big, for example, I put here Unity, I put PlayStation, HTC. These are very big companies. It's impossible for me to go there, knock on their doors and say, I want to invest in you. They'll come and slap me on the face. They'll say, you're too small for me to do this, right? So what I do with them is I connect with them and I collaborate with them. If I create partnership with them, imagine this, right? When I go to Unity, I said, look, I have 10 game developers that needs help in developing games. Would you be able to help them to show them how to better create games using your product. It's a win-win situation that we create. Same thing with PlayStation, same thing with HTC. But let's go back to the main product. The, game de- the first game developers that I invested in is Toge Production and Touch 10. Toge is very interesting because I asked him, what is your why? His why is very clear and simple. I want to be a great game developers coming from Indonesia and bringing my fellow game developers to the world stage. It's very simple. At that time, they only started off by selling games in Steam. They don't have mobile games. They don't have console games. So I asked them, do you guys like to play console games? Yes, we do. What is it that's missing in the, in the system? What is it that you need in the ecosystem? Remember, this is Indonesia back before Mobile Legends started. So games is like unheard of. And they said, well, we can't bring it to Indonesia because PlayStation, Xbox, deem Indonesia as a country that has problems with copyright. So what do we do then? Well, Toltoge, why don't you just open up a company in Singapore? If you open a company in Singapore, right, you have a branch there. You could get the PlayStation developer kit as a Singapore company. And they did that. And as a result, Toge Productions became the first, one of the first Indonesian gaming, one of the first Indonesian game developers that produce console games in PlayStations and Xbox. Isn't that a pride for all of us Indonesians? But that only shows what resilience. Once they have the right intentions, I want to achieve this. They might face obstacles, but if they have the courage to voice out what they want, like what Toge did, there will be help that could help them to overcome this. And the moment they do that, I put here the government, right? Backcraft and Backcraft and Agi here are from the government organization. Backcraft is a government organization. Agi is an association. So through the association, they create awareness to the government that, look, gaming in Indonesia is big. And there are talents for it. This was about the time when people realized that the Spider-Man, the Batman that we all bought in the U.S., some of them are drawn in our home country in Indonesia. And that is an eye-opener for many people who think that Indonesians do not have the talents, but Indonesia does have the talents. So I started off by by finding out the game developers. Through Toge's dream, I find a way to connect with the likes of PlayStation, HTC, and Unity. Because I know there's a need. And Unity is also Unity also have a need. So my function is just identify them and bridge them. It's connecting the dots. The moment the dots are connected, you could just sit back, relax, and just watch. It's the same thing as how Mother Nature works. It's beautiful. I did not have game publisher. Until today, there is no strong game publishers in Indonesia. But I know that Toge wants to be a game publisher, even though he didn't ever say, I want to be a game publisher. But when he said, my dream is to bring Indonesian game developers to the world, I know his roadmap is to become a game publisher. So it's okay if we do not identify everything. Airbnb, when they first started, they only know house, renter, 
and homeowners. That's it. But if you were persistent enough and you know you have gone deep enough, you would be able to find all of those intricates around it. Distributors and retailers, we only have Steam, PlayStation, App Store, and Google Play. At that time, China market was untouched. I'll again use the sample of Tokyo Productions because of language, because of cultural barrier, and because of, well, a certain prejudice of how to enter into the Chinese market. Because some of my investors are from China, and China hosts the biggest game event in the world called as China Joy. It's unfitting if I don't go there. It's unfitting if I didn't bring my portfolio companies to go there. So on the first year, they were so reluctant. I just tell them, just give me a chance. Let's go. Make it feel like it's a trip. Come with me. They went there. They had an eye-opening moment of how big the market is. And they start to learn from the people in China, be it Chinese or non-Chinese, that are in the game industry. It's just all about connecting everyone. And the following year, David, 30% of one of their games come from China in terms of revenues. Previously, 70% comes from Europe and US. Right now, suddenly 30% comes from China and their revenue grow. That is one of the distributors because China had the massive, massive number of distributors, massive numbers of publishers as well because they do not have Google Play. And when it comes to this area, this is where it's very complicated because at that time, I was only able to find Revival TV. Revival TV today is the number one esports agency and live streaming platforms in Indonesia. But when I found them, their revenue, David, per year is not even $10,000. It's run by a very young CEO with a hunger and a passion for esports company. I could not find gaming arenas. Until today, there's no gaming arenas in Indonesia. Maybe next year, we'll go to gaming arenas in Meta first, right? There's no streaming services. There's no esports. Esports was unheard of. This is the kid who understand esports, who want to do it, but everybody ignored him. He was even kicked out of the house, David, because of what he wants to do. He was kicked out of the house. He was dumped by his girlfriend. He sold his car, moved to Jakarta, and started Revival TV. When I recognized what he wanted to do, I invested in him. A lot of people say that they are not going to make it, but today, they're number one. When we put together all of them, immediately, you could see that there is a line, right? With this, maybe not, but with Revival and Toge Productions, when Toge comes out with a new game, Revival could stream it to their streamers because they hold the community. When Unity would like to do anything to do with gamers and they need a media, I just open it up to Revival. Whether they use it or not is a different story, but at least I could connect the dots. And when we connect the dots, the wheels start to rotate. So it's like a wheel of life in, ecos in our na natural ecosystem. The sunshine and then the rains, it's as simple as that. It's all about connecting the dots. So that's what I do in the gaming industry, to find out what is available. To find out what's available and just to connect them together. Because the moment the right people are connected together, with their same sense of purpose, they would automatically be working on their own. And when we understand the purpose of the existence or the why you need the access, why PlayStation exists, why Backcraft exists, Backcraft is a government entity, why Revival TV exists, and why Toge Production exists, I'm able to draw the lines and I'm able to craft a win-win collaboration partnership between all of them. As an ecosystem spotter and builder, I do not have to build everything from scratch because that's not my strength. When we want to build a productive ecosystem, be a glue, just glue them all together. But always remember to the roots because when we follow what nature does and make it a balanced ecosystem, it's going to work. So if I'm to summarize everything, the first one is we identify who are in the ecosystem. Second one is find out their purpose. Like humans, every country, every business have a reason for existence. Back to the word Sun Yi. 
the reason for living applies to every company. There are reasons for existence. Why does this company need to exist? Why did this founder create this company? That's identifying the purpose. And you connect the dots to make a win-win solutions. Once you're able to do that, what's going to happen is a flow. I'm sure a lot of us, we know this infinity. Infinity is a never-ending loop. It's a flow. Productivity is involved around this loop. So it becomes a never-ending, flowing, abundance flow of happiness, light, and love. Simple as that. But the flow, it could grow bigger. It could grow smaller. And I always believe that the growth of the infinity loop, it depends on how much we can handle and how much that we share with other people. That is what determines this. One small example before I end this presentation and give it to David again, I know I'm taking up quite a lot of time, is a continuous evolution. Just like human nature, just like the nature itself, everything evolves. We study human evol evolutions. We study business evolutions. But in our life, it's the same thing. Continuous evolution. So I started off by building the ecosystem of the gaming industry. Right now, we are in the era of play-to-earn economics. Play-to-earn economics meaning the crypto space. When I see that opportunity, what do I do? I jump straight in. Because my essence is play. My mission is is to make sure that a lot of people play. Because whoever you are, wherever you are watching this, I'm sure all of us love to play. We might not like to play video games, but we play a lot of things. So it's all about playing. And so when I saw that play to earn is here, I believe this is here to stay. Because it's going to change a lot of people's prejudice and mindset about what gaming is. I'm sure a lot of us, especially in Japan, face a lot of prejudice being a gamer, right? So what is play to earn? Let me introduce you to this guy. His name is Subandi. He picks trash from the street, but he wasn't always a trash picker. He was working in an office, but there was an accident that happened at work. That's why one of his hands was gone. If you look at closely, his left arm is no longer there. Because of that accident, he had to lose his job and revolves around trash picking around the city of Jakarta. The phone that he's holding is an Axie Infinity game. It's a play-to-earn game. To, you can see the three little cute thing over there. We call that as Axis. The value of one Axis is approximately $200 to $500. This is Axie Infinity. So the value of this is $200 to $500. If you do the math to start playing the games, you need around $600 to $1,500. There's no way Subandi can afford it. So taking the example of Airbnb, what happened? There is a creation of Yield Guild games. YGG started off from the Philippines, from gamers who spot this opportunity, who see that there are so many gamers out there that could benefit from playing Axie Infinity. And Axie Infinity is just one of the many games that will come out. And as a result of that, they create a guild. And just like any other guild, they invest in Axie Infinity, they invest in all those Axies, and they distribute a scholarships for the players to earn. And as a result of that, today, in Indonesia, ar around the world actually, a lot of people like Subandi now has, can earn a living. There are so many stories, David, because it's not only Subandi. Subandi is clear that he needs economic assistance. But there are also students. There are also office workers that are of a higher rank that lost their job during the pandemic. So this comes as a very handy tool for them, a very handy alternative for them to start earning. I've got students, I've got, I've got students playing actually infinity games right now in Indonesia that almost drop out of school if it's not because of this game. I'm collaborating with universities to make sure that students stay in school. So in this ecosystem, I'm not going to go fanatical about it or obsessive about it, but there are so many stakeholders that we're going to put on the map, the universities, the factories, the shops, 
the businesses that are affected by the pandemic, and they all have the workers. And that is why on the 1st of November, 2021, we launched Yield Guild Game Southeast Asia, which is the logo that you see below. And I'm here to lead Indonesia operations to make sure that more people like Subandi, his life could change. There will be many more games of Axie Infinity that we are going to invest in, that we're going to distribute to the gamers, and we're going to change the world to show the world that gamers is a profession. And so we can eliminate at least one judgment on one profession on earth. And as we do that, I feel the flow will grow as and when we are ready. So before my game industry was like that, with play to earn, I believe the flow will be bigger. And as the flow is bigger, responsibility is bigger, but the fun will be even more. With that, that will be the last of my presentations. I'll give it back to David. So surely, how can we uh, promote this kind of entrepreneurship? Because it sounds easy, but actually in reality, it's not that easy. When you have a two choices, people usually won't go for job security, but entrepreneurship might sound cool, but it also means that you have no job security until you get successful. Entrepreneurship is, it sounds cool, but it involves a lot of hard work. So um, entrepreneurship means that you have to do everything yourself, right? So I, I do have a, a small restaurant as well. When my employees stop working or when the chef is mad, I have to go down to the kitchen, right? And start cooking myself. So being an entrepreneur doesn't always mean that we become the boss. But going back to your question of risk of first, I believe that entrepreneurship, it does not only mean that owning a business. Entrepreneurship could be nurtured within an organization or within a company itself. That's why there's a term called as intrapreneurship. Because what is entrepreneurship? Is Entrepreneurship is about finding your meaning of life. And when you find your meaning of life, it doesn't matter what the risk is, you're going to take it and you're going to do it anymore, anyway. It doesn't matter what the risk is, you're going to do it anyway. Because that's what makes you happy. Yes, of course, a lot of people are afraid that, oh, what if I lose my job? Then I don't have income anymore. I had that experiences because I came from corporate finance background. I work in an established multinational companies that I love until today. I still love that company. But when I decided to leave that company, I let go a lot of things. I let go of salary, free traveling when we go on a business trip, of course, right? And a lot of other perks. But I knew at that time, if I did not leave that comfort zone that I'm in, if I wait until I have a family and until I have commitment, I might be regretful of that. So I asked myself, what is the worst that could happen after I quit my job? I fail my business. I try a few business. I fail. Or maybe I don't even have the courage to start. What's the worst that could happen? I asked myself that question and I thought long and hard. And I realized that I'll lose time, but I'll gain experiences. Because life is all about experiences, right? So I quit my job. But before I quit my job, I have a buffer of money for my parents and for myself. And that faith. Irene, if I lose everything, would I be able to find a decent job and get myself back on the feet? And are you willing to risk it all and start from the very beginning? I say yes. And I realize now, being an entrepreneur, being a business person, when I started my F&B company, I asked myself that. Should I go back to university and learn about food and beverage? Because I know nothing, David, nothing about F&B other than eating, right? And I thought to myself, do I want to waste two years in a university reading books? Or do I want to send, spend two years doing real work, running the business, putting my money on the table, skin on the game? I think I will do the second one better because we all have been to schools, right? How many times does our parents need to kick us to go and study? It's the same amount of money. So at that time, I decided, you know what? I'm going to go trust life, go to university of life, start my F&B business. And today, 
that business is thriving, not like super great, but I'm passionate about it. And I'm happy to report that as of today, as of August, actually, 2021, since COVID, we have distributed 30,000 free meals, plant-based meals to people who are in need. And right now, the next BHAC that we have is 100,000 meals. And with that, there's a balance in the business. So same thing in everything in life. It's about everything has a risk. But like, as I'm philosophical because I'm quite spiritual, I believe the risk that we have, the fear that we have in starting something, it has to do with a certain things that we have done in the past, in our childhood that stop ourselves from doing something else. When in my case, in F&B business, I remember my mom used to tell me, Irene, if you start an F&B business and you don't know how to cook, you better don't start it because it's going to fail. Because I was so scared in starting an F&B business. I was so freaking scared because I didn't know what it was all about that I have to find a partner to do it with me. When the partnership fail, I have to face the real truth, university of life. And I, I was trying to find out why am I so scared? So to all of you guys out there, if you are scared of starting something, find out the reason why you are scared and remove that fear. Because once it's removed and you know what is the worst that could happen and you are okay with it, all you have to do is just play. Because life is really about playing. How can we nurture this mentality for not being afraid of making mistakes? Because in many cases, people tend to rely on the negative reinforcement. means that your parents or whoever that is the he- who are in authority might scold you for making mistakes. Then whenever you make a mistake, you get scolded and scolded. And later, you will get more and more afraid. And then you will end up not taking any risks. I faced that in my final phase of my corporate career in Singapore. That is a very tough and challenging and competitive environment. At that time, I encountered uh, a superior who, is, who makes me feel stupid, like I'm the stupidest person on the planet. But today, I have to thank him as my biggest angel in my life that pushed me out of the corporate world. Because at that time, I remember asking myself, right, why do I keep this job? job security. What else? Well, I'm a breadwinner for my family. Okay. What else? Well, this is how life should be, right? I should progress like this. Uh, I should be, you know, going through promotions loops over and over again, climb up the corporate ladders. What else? Well, if I quit my job, my parents will not have anything to be proud of anymore. And I found out that's the root. And so I went to my parents (laughs) and I asked them, And it scared me so much, David, to go up to them and tell them that, look, mom, dad, I do want to resign. And this is the reason why. And they saw that I wasn't happy. And of course, my mom is worried. But my dad said, well, if you are not happy, then do what makes you happy. Everything will be okay. I'm lucky because I had that conversation with my parents. But And it might all seem easy, but my mom is a tiger mom. My dad is a tiger daddy who want nothing but perfection for me. If I get 99 in school, they would demand for 100. If I get 100, they will ask me, is there any kids who get a 100 score or perfect score? So it's never perfect, right? But the funny thing, David, is that when I brought out this conversation with them, they didn't remember it. The thing is, as a kid, as a child, now that we are adults, we think about the past, right? That instill those fear in us that we have to follow the authority figures, that we have to do A, B, C, and so on and so forth. We remember that like as if it's programmed, hard-coded into our brain, our heart. And so there's a scar inside that program how the way we work in the future and how the way we live. But as I walk back and I told myself, look, I want to heal this. I don't want to feel this way. And I went, traced back to the roots and the roots is because my parents scolded me because of that 99%, 100%, I'm never perfect, right? I'm never going to be good enough for anyone. And if I'm never good enough, then it means that I'll never receive the love from my parents. That is the root. So I went up to them, being a super awkward conversation with your Asian parents. Imagine this, yeah, with Asian parents. Go up to them and say, 
Mom, Dad, you know what? When we were kids, you told me that 99% is not good enough. You told me 100% is not good enough. You know, it's so difficult to please you guys because I don't know what is good for you. And if it's not good for you, do you actually love me? Like, why do you push me that way? David, my parents were shocked. They were like, that was never our intention. Our intention was that because we see that you had the potentials, but you're being lazy. And that's why we push you because we thought you're competitive. But we are okay, even though if you get 60%. But I did not know that until I brought up that conversation. And when, can you imagine the relief? It's like a huge stone is relieved from my heart. And I feel a lot of people need to go through this because I understand that those are from the upbringings. And never discount any feelings that you have. Because remember, all this programming, it happens when we were a kid. Right now, when we think back, we might think that, oh, that's a small thing. It doesn't matter. Because we are adults and we are programmed to see that, oh, you know, don't be, don't be petty. Small things, just close both your eyes and move forward. But those small things are the one that imprints in our heart and our brains. And those needs to be cleansed. Those needs to be energetically cleared. And when we actually go up to our parents and speak to them after we clear that thoughts and emotions, you also release your parents of that burden. Because they would be wondering, why is this kid the way he, he or she is? And our parents, they don't know how to communicate with us. We don't know how to communicate with them. But when we know that our intention is to clear these feelings and want to live freely, then we'll go up to them. Simple things, yeah. When I was in the corporate world, I was demanded to dress up properly. Because as a banker, international banker, corporate finance, you got to look sharp all the time, even though you have meeting at 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, when I look back, are we as human defined by our titles? Are we human is defined by our clothes, the clothes we wear? No. I think COVID teaches us a huge thing that through this Zoom, this little camera over here, we can connect with anyone in the world. And someone might be all prim and proper on the top, but if you ask them to stand up, I can guarantee you 50% of them are in their shorts. So <laughs> does all of those accolades really define us as a human? No. My suggestion is to dig deep inside us and to find out, you know, why are we interested in a productive ecosystem? Why are we interested in a productive entrepreneurship? There's a reason for that. And we are all here. Our existence is here for a reason. So why don't we find that? you will be unstoppable. As an investor, I'm sure that you don't want to make mistakes either because you invest in a company. It turned out that actually the CEOs are not ready or founders are not ready. And you, they just burned the money that you invested and not making profits. Uh, they're not doing well, but still you keep doing it. You still keep investing, trying to find uh, good entrepreneurs. Why would you do that? In the world of venture capitals, I, I do not like to quote this, but a lot of venture capitals, the way we work is you invest in 10 companies, you invest in 100 companies. If you get one unicorn, all your costs are covered. All you need is just one unicorn. In DNC and in all the funds that I run, I don't treat uh, entrepreneurs, I don't treat founders like as if they are just a data point to go to the next levels. Do I have entrepreneurs that fail? I do. But until today, we still remain friends because we know we tried our best. It's just not the right time. It's just not the right industry. It's just not the right market, unfortunately. So why do I want to become investors right now? Why do I want to risk it? Because when I look at so many entrepreneurs, there are some of them that really could make it. Some of them, it might be 50-50%, but everybody the ones that are passionate and really hungry, they just need to have a shot. I live my life receiving many, many, many shots from people throughout my career, many opportunities. So when I'm an investor, I have a chance to give back, but this is not a charity. So for every single companies that we invest in, we invest in our time also. Money is a last thing, but we invest a lot of our time sitting down with each and every one of them, sitting down with them through ups and downs to make sure that they get there. If they do not get there, at least they learn something. One example that brings us to Yogil Games that I mentioned just now, it started three years ago. 
there was a company called as Alto Games. It started off as a game developer. But today, three years later, the two entrepreneurs, they strive, they move forward, they keep changing, they keep ad- adapting for their love for games. And today, they are called OP Games. OP Games just closed an $8.6 million fundraising, and they are going to be doing IDO either end of this year or beginning of next year. It's from three years of ups and downs. And we are proud to call them our portfolio companies. But most importantly, I'm proud to call them my friend. From the government side, when you see the regulations, for example, we talk about the regulations being harmful. Of course, uh, we need the regulations to protect the industry sometimes. It's also true that too many regulations can kill the innovative minds or innovative culture. I have misconceptions about the government that, oh my God, working with the government, the red tape will be crazy, the bureaucracy will be crazy. But I've been lucky that I've worked with them under my F&B arms, right? And also under game industry arms. It's all about sitting down and understanding. Understanding each other's perspective. Once we understand that, anti-policies could actually be changed because policies are man-made. If it's beneficial for the government, it's beneficial for the industry, and most importantly for majority of the people, I don't see any reasons not to change it. Again, it's all about connecting the dots. The problem with a lot of individuals now, be it in whichever sector that is there, is that not looking for that win-win solutions. Because in the end of the day, government is also run by humans. Government would like to curb everything, control everything as much as they can to control the economy for the goodness of the entire nations. It's, it's, it's just that balance. But finding that balance is difficult. So you touch upon the government, which is interesting. But the way I look at it is that a lot of us, right, it's easy for us to go and protest, right? It's easy for us to say that this government is ineffective. But a lot of times those inefficiencies or those protests come in within six months when the government sits in. If you think about it, six months for him or her to sit in that position, he's got a lot of things to catch up. You got to give time for a person to show that they can do something, right? And it's not effective for us to do that. The question is the moment we finger points at other people, be it the government or not, remember four fingers are pointing at ourselves. So what is it, ask ourselves, what is it that we can do for the government. Today itself, when I was in the gaming sector, when I am in the gaming sector, when I first started it, I always have conversation with the government. When they are not ready, I'm okay. I told them it's okay. I just tell you I'm here. (laughs) This is what I'm doing. At least I've shown my courtesy to tell you that this is what I'm doing. When you are ready, when you want to learn, I'll be here to support And today, Indonesia, not to my involvement, is to one of our portfolio companies that are very, I have exited that company, but until today, we still remain friends. He is in one of the committee of the esports for Indonesia. And these are the players, the ecosystem players that push up to that point that Indonesia have an esports team that could compete at an international level. It's all about balancing. You are, you are very, very right. It's all about balancing, David. But We can't pinpoint or judge that a government is such, an entrepreneur is such, because a lot of people also have a prejudgment that entrepreneurs are all, you know, they they just want money, right? Or investors are all sharks. (laughs) They just see you as data points. But that's not true because in the end of the day, we are all humans. It just goes back to the nature of how things work from the very beginning before all the complications are there. Just, Just look at the nature. We can learn a lot from there. In Indonesia, there are some unicorns like uh, Tokopedia, Gojek, or Bukalapak, and Traveloka. They have been doing a great job. Uh, they started very small, and then they became really big, and they have been very successful. It's always amazing to see the, how they have been growing in Indonesia. That must have some reasons for that in terms of the business environment. I think the main factor is one to the let's talk about data indonesian population is 50 percent of southeast asia population right so in terms of market sizing indonesia is a market in itself it's like a mini china right in terms of populations second thing is if we look at the way or the opportunities to do business here 
It's huge, David. That's the very reason why I come back to Indonesia. Because you can start a business fairly, you can say quite easily if you are an Indonesian. All you have to do is register for a company and then your company is started, right? And to try out new ideas, to try out new things, the Indonesians, they are very open to it. Give you an example of an esports competition, one of the first esports competition that was done by Revival TV. Have you imagined this? Yeah, in the midst of a competition, the sound system went off. The screen was blank in the middle of a live competition. In most countries, what will people do? Would people complain? <laughs> right? Most people will complain and will boo the person, the, will boo the, what do you call it? The, will boo the organizer. But in Indonesia, instead of booing the organizers, the crowd is cheering for them. The crowd is cheering for them and tell them, you can fix it, you can do it, let's get the game started again. So Indonesians, the nature of the people, we are very forgiving. So it's okay to make mistakes. When people make mistakes, yes, there will be some people who like, ah, nya, 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 nya. there will be those people. But there will be people, if you explain to them, it's, it's the nature of service, right? If you explain to them, they will understand. And in fact, they will support you and appreciate you even more. That's why Indonesia is very service-based. If we go to any part of the world and you see Indonesians, the hospitality is there. So it's a perfect breeding ground for a lot of home brands. And one of my fun, we invest in indie brands, in homegrown Indonesian brands. Because if we look at Indonesia, given the huge population, huge markets, there is no single brands that is dominant that is locally made. Because for decades, people have been buying products from overseas. People feel that foreign products are better. But right now, the reverse has started to happen. And so there are a lot of homegrown Indonesian-based brands that have started to grow. And the people, they could be mean, the, the customers could be mean, but those are very little in terms of populations. Number three is the differences in the people's skin, for example, culture, for example, and preference. Clothes that are super neon colored might not be accepted in the city of Jakarta. But if you bring them to Papua, those colors are very well sought after. So there is a product. A product has different markets, and all those markets are available in Indonesia. I touch upon skin color because makeups of Indonesian women, we have different skin colors. If you go from Aceh all the way to Merauke, all of us, we look different. We need different makeups, but all of us live in a tropical world. Who can understand us better than the Indonesians? And that is why cosmetics... Beauty products is one of the top three hot-selling items in the, the likes of the unicorns that you mentioned, Tokopedia, Shopee, and all that. It's top three, even during the pandemic, even when people don't go out. <laughs> those are the reasons why Indonesians are very successful. And that's the reason why I can't represent the entire Indonesians, but I could say that I come back to Indonesia because I want to do business and I want this place, this country to the place I start. Even if you don't start something innovative from scratch, yeah, because entrepreneurship is all about business, about trading, right? You can go to a shop, for example. Go to, don't, don't go to any other shop. Go to Ikea, for example. Buy the products there. Come bring it back. Sell it in your neighborhood at a 10 to 20% margin. People still buy because it's convenient, right? Because IKEA is located so far away, nobody have a car. So if you can go there, they call it just tip, just a tip, tip. So you go there, you get buy your stuff, and your neighbors all want to buy stuff, and they know that this is the price. You mark it up by twenty percent or ten percent, or you charge them fifty thousand per trip. People will pay for it. It's with the emergence of 
Gojek, with the emergence of Grab, Grab's ecosystem is the most complete in Indonesia. As an Indonesian, I got to say that I'm very, very proud of this because whenever I travel, I actually miss these two services. Where in the world do you have salon coming to your house, doing your pedicure, manicure at your home using an app to order? Where in the world, you, in one app, yeah, do you have a cleaner that can come to your house? Someone who can uh, wash your car, someone who can give you a massage, someone who can go to the pharmacy and get you you know, your medicine, someone who could go to supermarket and help you to get your stuff, someone who can go to deliver documents for you, buy food, food is normal, ride is normal. But the, th the seven things that I mentioned, those are all available at the touch of a button. I don't see anywhere other than China that has this. And the adoption rates, because Indonesians, the moment you give them something that they like and con they are convenient, the adoption rate is really fast. Mm. So if like China in the past, they leaped through the era, right? They started from cash. And a lot of people, they don't even have bank accounts or credit cards. Some maybe have bank accounts. They, they, have, they don't have credit cards. So they jump through the loop of credit card by having we pay. Mm. We are seeing that phenomenon in Indonesia. And when we talk about play to earns or MetaMask, meta Indonesia is in one of the top 10. And a lot of Indonesians don't have bank accounts. So I wouldn't be surprised with the adoption of play to earn games. I think a lot more Indonesians will have MetaMask account, a crypto wallet as their first bank account instead of a real bank account. Even though we talked about the making mistakes is important and also the creating the forgiving environment is also important. The kind of culture is important. It's also true that we have to do our best to avoid making mistakes. If we make mistakes intentionally, then that's different case. Because I believe in humans' best interests. But there are also people who are lazy, who wants to take shortcut, right? So that one can be avoided. And that one, another treatment is needed. But in, I believe in the basic human kindness. Even if they are lazy, there's a reason for that. If we find the root cause of it, that person will not be lazy anymore. I do that to every one of my employees. If everybody would like to do or act for the best interest of the nature and resources, right? Nobody will want to intentionally waste resources. Nobody. I agree. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah, unless Every they have a bad intentions, wants. right? Yes. Mm. Nobody. You ask anyone in the world, David, do you want to make a positive change and change the world? Deep inside, everyone's answer is yes. But no one will dare to say yes, because the next question will be, so what will you do? And the answer is, I don't know, because it's too big. But if you break it down into smaller pieces, that's what I do with my F&B industry because it's vegan restaurant, right? I always tell people is that we make three decisions in a day to eat. And if I tell you by just changing one meal into a vegan meal can improve the environment, can reduce the demand for meat and can improve the environment overall, you know, would you do it? Maybe not a lot of people would do it, but in, with a little bit of research, they might find out that to change the world is not that difficult. Because it comes to the small little things. We are not promoting, as you just said, the, the, the failure. We are not promoting the making mistakes and just go fail. We are not talking about that. Of course, we have to do our best to be successful. And as entrepreneurs, even though we do our best, not only because of internal problems, but also the social problems or external reasons, they go fail. So based upon your first-hand experiences with, as a VC with the entrepreneurs, what did you see in them when they fail? It starts with self-doubt, David. It always starts with self-doubts because you can see a person work so hard trying their very best physically, but inside, if they have determined that they fail, they will fail. Self-doubt is just one of the many reasons because but the fundamentals is definitely one, self-doubts. Second one is the personal interactions between the founders that leads to self-doubts or lead to a shaking of the partnership. I'll give you an example for the second one. 
and also a combination of two layer yeah, of a uh, one startups that have started a long time back it was early days in my venture capitals it's a partners of three people when i first invested one of partners dropped so there are only two left these two partners they used to be good friends and these two partners Well, you could say that they are match made in heaven, and that's why I invested in them. One is really good with marketing. One is really good with tech and operations. So that was how it was started. But at the beginning, unfortunately, the business that they started has a lot of competitions of similar industry, and so these two start to drift apart. Because when we say match made in heaven, it's usually the opposite of each other, right? They fulfill each other. So, with the pressure of the society, with the pressure from the staffs, with the pressure of the new entrepreneurs, we can see that one of them have started to instill self doubt within them. What? How do I say that? Because whenever I visit the office, he started to be closing up himself. He refused to mingle with the staff and the other team members, and prefer to stay in the in the meeting room by himself. That was the first sign that we see. Because he felt the pressure of being a leader that he needs to show everything. The other one, being an extrovert and a marketing person, was just like, "What is wrong with you? Go out and hang out with people. You know, I need you to take care of the kitchen. You know, I need you to take care while I go out and make businesses." But this is not able to do that. So, and he, there is a self doubt that this guy has. So when I set the two down, it was a bit too late, David. This does, unfortunately, this does not result in a business failure, but this resulted in a partnership failure because these partners need to split. And the one who left the company is the one with the great self doubts. And it took around three to six months for the other guy to find another co-founder and to grow the business together. But he was lucky that he found a co-founder right in time because after his partner left, you could see. The self doubt start to seep in. As an investor who watched from the side, right, I could only go in and inspire them. I could only go in and intercept whenever they allow me to, because this is all about heart, right? I can't just go in and bang on someone's heart. Hey, let me in. Something is off with you, you know. I can't do that. But I could always go there and be the, their mediator, because like when these two good friends split up, I was there for them, for both of them. And I was there to mediate the process, so it becomes a friendly process and doesn't impact the business as much as I could. And for that, that the second founder who survived, the investors, we were there for that for him to make sure that he could find a new co-founder and lead it out. And right now, the business has flourished and it has been acquired by one of the unicorns that you mentioned. But the major, major things that needs to stop is judgment and be open, because. I see there's a huge gap between stakeholders. If we talk about the startups, right? We talk about the government just now, and we also talk about big corporates that has been there for a long time. They're the dinosaurs, right? They're the big conglomerates. There's a gap between this. The government is taking the role of a policeman, trying to govern everyone. It's a position of authority. As a result, there's a gap between the government and the industry. As much as the government try to reach out to this, this does not open up. But sometimes, as much as the companies try to reach out to government, the government doesn't open up. Why is that? Because before the meeting, there's always a, a judgment. I'm not saying to all, but most of the time, there's a judgment. Oh my God! If I bring this to the government, I'm sure they're going to bring me to this, 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 this. So I better not not look into this. From the government side. Oh, I want to fish for information so I can find more tax. But if I can think of the entire economy as a whole and not only think about taxations, I could perhaps work with them together. You know that sort of openness, that sort of creation of a sandbox where we play all cards on the table and stop playing politics. Then I believe we could save a lot of time, money, and resources. And this has always been appro- the approach that I take whenever I deal with. Anyone really, and that is why the relationship. Fortunately, the relationship that I have with the government is really good and very transparent. Because I lay call, cards on the table, I was like, "Bupa," we call them ibu bapa, right? In because um, one of my companies, the F&B industries, one of our goal is to 
take um, vegetable directly from the farmers. When I find out that the government actually do urban farmings, but every year they throw away their resources because nobody want to take it from them and because they don't know who to go to, I, I bought it from them. I'm happy. They're happy. The farmers are happy. The environment is even better. There's less waste. But all it takes is just drop the ego and just talk to them. I believe with communication and without all those walls, like titles, I am a government officer, and hence I need to behave a certain ways. Look, David, I, that, I think a lot of Indonesian government that I've met with, they, they, are, they are used to me, they have accepted me thankfully as I am. I would be one of the very few who will walk into the government offices and I'll tell them, I'm really sorry, I need to wear, wear sneakers because I, I have back pains if I wear heels, right? So I'll be the only one who wears sneakers in the government official buildings, right? And I will be speaking very casually because usually I'm also invited for the uh, Indonesian government sharing sessions. And I will always start, I'm really sorry, I can't, my Indonesian is not that good. I don't know how to speak too formally. So I apologize in advance if I say anything wrong. And with that, you know, with that openness, I think they soften up. <laughs> it works all the time. But I am, I'm, I'm being honest, right? Because my bahasa sucks. So I told them up front that this is, this is what it is. And I just casually told them, this is my problem. This is how I think I can solve it. Why don't we do a win-win solutions? And 95% of the time, you can melt any, anyone with this. So it, it takes communications. And you know what, David? It does not only happen between government and corporates. The sad thing is it also happens between corporates who would like to help NGOs and NGOs who need help from the, the corporates. There is a gap because the language use is very different. Each are protecting their own rights. That is the biggest problem of how to glue the entire ecosystem together. Thank you so much for sharing your insight on the topic. I hope that these videos could connect to more people and could melt people's hearts so that everyone can connect together to build a more productive ecosystem for a better world. Thank you very much, David. Fears, thank you so much for joining our interview today. Stay well and stay healthy. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on a lot. So see you next time.